Hope you enjoy. Stand and deliver Shadows in the Moonlight by Rachel Lawson. Read by the author. It was a cool crisp night in the Epping Forest. The stage moved amongst the shadows of a full silver moon, which gave the forest a magical glow for Mary Gregory, the passenger in the coach. Her brother, the magistrate, the Thomas Gregory, thought it felt less magical and more eerie and dangerous. He saw highwaymen and footpads in every shadow. The driver was also nervous, as highwaymen were known to work these woods. Suddenly a man with gleaming guns on a white horse rode out of the shadows into the moonlight. He was handsome and well dressed. The nervous driver sped up the coach. The horseman followed at a faster pace. Stop or I'll shoot, he shouted. Firing his pistol, he winged the driver. He knew the next shot might kill him, so he slowed and stopped the coach. The rider pulled up to them and dismounted. Stand and deliver your money or your life, shouted the highwayman. Mary and her brother climbed out of the coach. Ah, good evening, my lady, and Sir Thomas Gregory. It is a lovely evening, is it not? said the highwayman, as he kissed Mary's hand. Oh, yes, it is, responded Mary, enchanted by the moonlight and his gallantry. No, it is not. I would rather have missed this meeting, Faulkner, said the magistrate, recognising him from one of the posters. Faulkner? Not Gentleman John Faulkner? Asked Mary. Guilty, said the highwayman, smiling behind his mask. The goods, please, said Thomas, added Faulkner, pointing his gun at the magistrate. Mary offered up her jewellery. Now keep your things, my lady, said Faulkner, giving her jewellery back. Her brother reluctantly handed him his purse of money. The highwayman next turned to the driver, whose arm was bleeding badly, and holding out his hand, for more booty, John said, Now, you, sir, you shall get that arm looked at. It, it looks quite bad. The driver handed over his valuables. The highwayman sent them on their way. Sir Thomas driving with the driver inside the coach being tended by Mary. Two nights later, Mary took to the road as a masked highway woman. She looked like a youth. She had bound herself up to look like a man. She was enjoying the thrill of riding through the night. It was the first outing of this new highwayman. The highwayman nearly held up a coach, but nobody beat this would be hireman to it, so turning the horse and heading home was all that could be done. The next morning the Gregory home had a visitor. Mary was very excited to meet this famous man she had never met before. He was a tall, handsome man. From the moment Mary saw him, she knew she could easily love this man. His name was Sir Justin Beaufort. Hello, my lady said the actor. I hear you met a real highwayman the other day. I wish I had been with you. They are so thrilling and romantic. Yes, they are, agreed Mary, in love with her new life style, and the man who robbed them. Oh, they are dangerous mercenaries. The driver of the coach died from the wound he got from the highwayman.
Where did you forget that? Asked Sir Thomas, suggesting look chastened and nervous. Did he have a family? Asked Sir Justin. More than likely. They'll hang Faulkner now he's killed someone, said Sir Thomas. He won't hang. It was an accident, said Mary. He shot the man he should have realised there was a chance the man would die, said Sir Thomas. If they get him, they will hang him, I'm sure of that, said Sir Justin. Sadly. Later Mary was riding in a coach with Sir Justin, and she heard, Stand and deliver your money or your life. The voice yelled. When the coach stopped, she leapt out of the coach to see the driver being murdered with a single shot to the heart for no other reason than he didn't stop quickly enough. She was now nervous. This was the feared killer, Highwayman, Terence the Terror of Essex. Hand over your loot. Either give it to me now or I'll take it from your body, Terence the Terror said to her. She did so quickly. Out of the coach stepped an angry Sir Justin. That's enough, Terry. Give it back, said Sir Justin. This startled the Terror. He was confused. Justin walked over, disarmed him, and pointed the Terror's own gun at him. I said give it back, Terry, said Sir Justin. Don't call him Terry. People say he doesn't like that. This isn't the theatre. He'll kill you. Mary said nervously. You'll have to wait in line, said Sir Justin with a smile. Sir Justin, you are annoying me. Nobody robs me, not even my friends. You will pay for this. Stand down, and I will. Forget it. Terence the Terror. Stand and deliver, Terry, said Sir Justin. He's drunk, ignore him, Mrs. Terror, said Mary. He's stone cold, sober and stubborn, said the highwayman. Terence the Terror handed back the loot, but he was fuming. Sir Justin shot in the air to disarm the gun. Here you are, my friend. Have your property back, and let us go on our way, Sir Justin said. You are not my friend, said Terence the Terror, stomping over his horse. You know something, I think I have lost a friend, said Sir Justin sadly, as he drove the coach off. You are insane, shouted back Mary from inside the coach. Later in the Gregory home, Tom, your friend is a knight, Mary said when they arrived with the body of the driver. What do you do, murder the driver so he could drive the coach? Asked Sir Thomas. Sir Justin laughed. Oh, that was Terence the Terror, said Sir Justin. Oh, did he kill the driver so you could drive it? Said Sir Thomas. Are you insane? Asked Sir Justin. No, said Sir Thomas. Terence the Terror held us up. He shot the driver. Then I held up the Terror. Said Sir Justin. You did what? Asked Sir Thomas. I bailed up the Terror. I took your sister's stuff back. As she was under my care. Said Sir Justin. Thank you. Did you take him in? Asked Sir Thomas. No, I let him go. Said Sir Justin. Why did you do that? Asked Sir Thomas. Someone had to drive the coach. I couldn't be. 
draw of Mary's safety if I kept him, replied Sir Justin. You know he'll now try to kill you, said Sir Thomas. If he does, he does. I could never live with myself if he robbed someone under my care, replied Sir Justin. That night Mary, the youthful highwayman, rode again. This time she stopped the coach and started to rob people. When three highwaymen arrived on the scene, New to this, are you, lad? said one of them. She panicked and fell off the horse, banging her head hard. It was knocked out by the fall. Terry, I think you've killed him, said one of the others. He was a black-clad highwayman named the Ghost, for his sudden appearances and disappearances. Ghost, the boy is knocked out, not dead, said Gentleman John, who was riding with them. Terry, just scared him, said John. We can't leave him here. What will we do? Said the highwayman the ghost, a Robin Hood type highwayman. They completed the robbery. John picked up Mary and hung her over his horse. The ghost took the horse of the young highwayman and rode off. To gentleman John's house. I'll look after him. He comes round, offered John. The odd band of highwaymen sat drinking and chatting for a few hours. Then the terror and the ghost left. When they had gone, John made a strange discovery. The boy had long hair in a bun. His hat had been pinned to it. He found out this when he tried to remove the hat so he could put what he thought was a boy to rest on his bed. He put her on the bed and sat looking at a script for a new play. He sat drinking for a while. Later, when the highway woman woke up, it was like a play with a ham actor. Where am I? she muttered. Putting down the script, he walked over to her. How are you feeling, miss? Asked John. Miss? Said the highway woman, not sure how he knew what she was, or where she was. Mary felt for her mask. It was there. I saw your hair. If we knew you were a woman... My friends would have stayed, said John. Why? she asked. For your honour, said John. Whoever said there is no honour among thieves? Oh yes, said the highwayman. Nothing happened, but I'll marry you to keep your honour, said John. The highwayman stood up, still a bit wonky. She thought she was dreaming. He was a man of honour, and she loved him, so she was happy. She started to take off her mask. He stopped her. No, don't, said John. We aren't safe seeing each other's faces. May cause us problems. All right, then, she said and stopped trying to unmask. In the early morning, she said goodbye and left for home. A few hours later, Mary was sitting in the forest near her home, enjoying the new autumn day. Justin saw her on the way to visit her brother. He got off his horse and tied it to a branch a small tree and walked over to her. What are you doing, my lady? asked Sir Justin, thinking she looked very pretty sitting amongst the leaves. She blushed. It is a funeral here today, said Mary, looking 
at Sir Justin, who looked more handsome than ever. It is a glorious day, said Sir Justin, not lying. Are you all right? Come sit beside me, said Mary. Why? asked Sir Justin. The view is best from here, said Mary. As long as no one's around, said Sir Justin, with a smile. No one is here. Sir Justin sat beside her. What are we looking at? asked Sir Justin. Everything. The wind is singing in the trees, blowing leaves through the air as they fall to the ground. Birds are singing, and the forest floor is covered in crisp leaves. Thick as snow, said Mary. We're getting propriety and everything. He lay on his back in the leaves. I have never seen anything so beautiful. I could forget everything and live in this moment forever. Then looked up at the sky, he said. This looks better. Mary lay back too, and watched the leaves fall from the trees blowing in the wind. A leaf fell down, floating onto her heart. She put her hand on it. A voice interrupted the scene. There you are, Mary. Have you been with him all night? Everyone has been looking for you, accused Thomas. No, oh, Sir Justin said, standing. I just found her here. I was on my way to see you. Mary, trying to stand up, fell over her long skirt. I was not with him, said Mary. Sir Justin thought he could see a forced marriage wedding being set up. I can't marry her, said Sir Justin. Why? I can't say, said Sir Justin, who was secretly engaged to a woman already. Had he known it was Mary, they would not have minded so. No excuses means that you must marry her for your honour and hers, said Sir Thomas. Don't use my honour against me said Sir Justin. You must marry her as you are driven by your honour. Sir Thomas said. Sir Justin shook his head, jumped on his horse and rode away. Later that day, Sir Justin sat with his friend, the Earl of Essex, a cousin of Gentleman Jack, in their friend the King's Library, chatting. How was your day, Sir Justin? asked the King. Great, I became engaged, said Sir Justin. Congratulations, said the Earl with his strong French accent. Who is she? asked the King. A sister or a friend of mine, said Sir Justin. Who is your friend? asked the Earl. A magister from Loughton, said Sir Justin. Not your friend, Sir Thomas Gregory, said the Earl. Yes, his sister, said Sir Justin, taking a sip of wine. His sister is lovely. She'll make a good wife for you, said the Earl. She thinks I'm a madman. Sir Justin said, taking another sip. Why on earth would you think that? asked the king. I battled up the terror, said Sir Justin, drawing a big sip of wine. You did what? asked the earl excitedly. Why on earth would you do that? asked the king. She was under my care. And the terror held us up. 
I was protecting her, said Sir Justin. So you robbed him, said the Earl. You are lucky to be alive. The terror is a killer, said the King. I know he killed the driver, said Sir Justin. He'll kill you for that, said the King. He'll be doing me a service, said Sir Justin. Are you all right, asked the Earl. I don't want to marry the girl, said Sir Justin. Later, Sir Justin went to the Earl's blacksmith, David Buckingham's shop, to get his horse reshod. Master Buckingham, how is your business going today? asked Sir Justin. Good. I have been very busy today, said David, as he reshod the horse. Your horse is calm today, said David, as I fed her. Before we came, calm her down, said Justin. A soldier walked in the smithy. Where's my gun, demanded the soldier. I'm busy, sir. Come back later, said David. No, I want it now, snapped the soldier impatiently. Patience is a virtue, said the smith. I have no time for words, said the soldier, kicking the smith. The startled horse kicked the smith in the guts. My gun, said the impatient soldier, not caring the man was hurt. Stand, man, said Sir Justin, pulling out his gun. Drew, are you all right? I feel like I was kicked by a horse, Jack, said the ghost. The soldier looked puzzled. Gentleman Jack glared at the soldier. Ghost got the gun, was a man and gave it to him. I fixed it now. The fee we agreed to, and be on your way, the ghost said. The soldier paid him and left. We need to get you to the doctor, said Jack helping his friend on to David's horse and jumped onto it and rode the ghost to his doctor. Later, Jack dropped the ghost off in town. He did what any man who'd been kicked by a horse would do. He went to the pub. And drank a little too much. When he was drinking, he heard a soldier talking about his old friend from the wars, who was still a soldier, being set, being set before a firing squad for a crime of another soldier. Do you want a blindfold? asked the captain of the regiment. No, Malcolm Giles, the man being shot called back. Ready, Elf? was all the captain called. He saw three highwaymen aiming at him. Shoot and your captain is dead, shouted Jack. Faulkner, stand and tell your friends to stand down. This man is getting his just desserts, shouted the captain. Terence Norton, aka the Terror. No, he was framed, the ghost shouted back. No, he was not, shouted Terry. Release him, ordered Jack. Do as he says, barked Terry. Not wanting to be shot. 
silver buckles, take the man his horse, said the ghost of the highway woman. She did as she was told. They had brought a spare horse from Malcolm. He leapt onto it, and they rode away. A hail of bullets. Sir Thomas, a soldier is here to see you, said the housekeeper of the Gregory house to her master. Show him to the library. I'll talk to him there, said Sir Thomas. Later in the Gregory Library, the soldier was shown in. It was Captain Terence Norton. What is your name? asked Sir Thomas. I would rather not say. I am here to help you catch a highwayman, said Terry. Why? asked Sir Thomas. I would rather not say. Terry said, I hear you want to catch the highwayman John Faulkner, said Terry. Yes, said Sir Thomas. The highwayman sat atop a great white war horse, as he told. The passengers to alight from their coach to Loughton from London. He was a strong and handsome and utterly, madly fashionable. All women loved him, and the men rather jealous of his getting all the women there, or else wanted to be him, but totally hated him. So was the case with Isabel Constance and the man who virtually worshipped her, but she was in love with the romantic highwayman, the Vice Count of Essex, John Faulkner, a perfect gallant gentleman, highwayman. Beside him was his constant companion on the road. A clever escape artist who disappeared into the shadows of the dark night in the lonely forest road to Newmarket. The companion was a Robin Hood who robbed only those who could afford to lose a little money, which he gave to an obliging churchman who promised he would give to the poor in the parish. Lieutenant Faulkner and the ghost, this is my lucky day, Isabella sang in her joy to the man who loved her but she could not love her own see. I can't see why we should be happy to be robbed, Stephen Grimshaw said irritably. In reply, he was angry and he wanted to protect her and his money. And a poem he wrote secretly to her anonymously, as he had many times before. She knew she had a secret admirer, but not his name. He was called Silver Star. He was a poet in love with her. What light from yonder window breaks? It is Juliet, said Faulkner, charmingly seeing her. Ham is not your style, Jack, the ghost scolded. Right you are, Drew. Pray excuse me, my dear lady. I was dazzled by your eyes. They are like two twinkling Silver stars. Was I out of line? Jack said contritely. Here is my money and ring. Everyone gives them your money and stuff, and they'll let us go, said Grimshaw, 
sharply as he glared at Jack. Yes, said the ghost. Oh, yes, said Jack. They gave the awkward highwayman what they wanted and they forgot to speak. Why then, said Grimshaw, you can go a Jew, the ghost said, with a strange French accent and not his usual local Essex accent. He was noted for. When the coach was gone, the highwaymen tore off their own masks. Justin, what was that about? What light from yonder window breaks? Your eyes are like two twinkling silver stars, shouted the ghost. She's a friend of mine. You know she hates me as much as I hate her. If I said, Isabel, give me your money, I would be giving myself away. You, the French ghost? I forgot who I was. I knew the man with her. He's my friend Stephen Grimshaw. He's a mind poet and he's in love with the girl. He's been sending her love letters from what I found out from being his go-between. He uses the nom de plume Silver Star. She's fallen in love with her admirer. Now, if I'm not mistaken, she thinks you are him. This won't make Grimshaw happy at all, the ghost said. He's not happy. How do you think I am? I'm engaged to two women already. Why not go for the trifecta and have more people wanting to see me dancing on the stage of Tyburn? Jack said, turning his horse to face his cousin, the Earl of Essex. Robert, what do you want me to do? Do we have to make her hate me and love your friend? He wants her, I don't. Jack said, yes, it will be easy. He's coming to my home. She is too. They'll be at my party, said the Earl. Oh, we can use that, said Jack. How, Justin? asked the Earl. By making her hate me and love him, said Jack. Tell her who you are, Jack the ghost. Very funny. It won't work, Jack said. She lynched me herself. Fine. I'll supply the tree. The oak out the front of my place. Perfect. Buy her a nice strong rope, joked the ghost. Who are you two planning to hang? A soldier who they didn't see arrive. Can I help you? Hello, Terry. You don't want anyone dead. I was only joking. Let's go home, the Earl said to his friends. He lives at his house. As his living guests. With... The run of the house. They were the Earl's maternal cousin and the youngest son of another Earl, whose wife and twin brother died when he was born and was taken in by Jack's family, who, although she had the blood of the Earl of Essex and was the aunt of the present orphan Earl, was his guardian. She raised him when he was in hiding as Andrew Fletcher. Like Smith's apprentice, his master's daughter was the Earl's fiance. Your ladyship is well, I hope, said Lord Essex, when Isabella and Grimshaw entered the sitting room, his library full of books and oddments with many maps and old weapons and comfy chairs. Well, his desk made of metalwork of the Earl himself as a secret but famed blacksmith. 
as David Buckingham. We were held up by highwaymen, said Grimshaw. Was anything stolen? asked Jack, with an air of concern. Mock, of course. He knew he'd stolen the poor girl's heart. Yes, they were highwaymen. I said they robbed us, didn't I? They ran about that way, said Grimshaw. He's thick, as well as heartless. He is the most annoying actor on any stage in London. Ignore him, he's a bore, said Isabella. Do you have a name, sir? asked Grimshaw. I am an actor, I have many, said Jack. Jack snapped the earl. When you were good, you were very, very good. When you were bad, you were horrid. Jack, are you a highwayman? asked Grimshaw, who was sure he was talking to his rival, the vice count. But why would the earl of Essex be a highwayman? Only at certain times, said Jack, not permanently. What are you on? John Faulkner, vice count of Essex. Pardon me? Oh, yes. Yes, and here's the ghost, Jack said. What, you admit it? Why did his lordship take to the road? said Grimshaw. Take to the road? I didn't take to the road. Neither did he. We leave that to my real cousin. Jack. The man is Sir Justin Beaufort. He and I took to the London stage in a theatre in a play about Jack and his friends. I play the ghost in it. Justin plays Jack, so I call him Jack. Nothing more. Stage name to keep him quiet. Said the Earl. Nothing sinister. There. Only that horse of mine. In the play. The only strange thing, and the script isn't too well written either, said Jack. Thanks, Jack. You know you have the play right here, said Terry. I know. I want a real horse and a good script. I could add loop better lines. So could all the cast. Why is the ghost the only one without a script? Jack complained. I memorized my lines. Before I rehearsed the play, said the Earl, in emergencies. You know that, Jack. Always an emergency, protested Jack. You usually cause it. Don't fight, we have guests, Terry said, afraid. One of them might say something they all might regret. Like the three of them were real highwaymen. And then... You'd have to kill these people. Who he held as friends. Terry hated being the bad guy. Who everyone saw as pure evil or insane. He was just as twitchy as the ghost. But the ghost didn't kill. And the ghost wasn't short-tempered. Nor had the feeling that he was the one who had to do the killing if it had to be done. As it was expected of Terry, not them. Terry could only hang once. And if he was caught. Jack, too, had winged a man who died of his wounds. The ghost may not hang. He may be deported or spend some time in prison. He hadn't done anything more than highway robbery. Oh yes, said the Earl, looking at Grimshaw's sad face. As he looked at Isabella, he met the real gentleman Jack and his friend the ghost, said Isabella gushing. Terry smiled and said, what were they like? 
wondering how his friend's lone expedition went? Gentleman Jack is the most charming man I've ever met, said Isabel. Terry looked at Justin like he had a private joke. Justin squirmed. Are you alright, Sir Justin? asked Grimshaw. Just feeling a little ill. My dinner didn't agree with me, said Justin, lying. He felt nervous. A man walked up to them with a woman. Hello, Sir Justin, said the man. Hello, Gregory, said Sir Justin. I haven't met your friends, said Isabella. Oh, they are Sir Thomas Gregory and his sister Mary. Another fan of Gentleman Jack, said Justin. She's his fiance, said Sir Thomas. Gentleman Jack? Said Isabella, looking sad to hear he was engaged. Both Mary and Justin looked awkward. Mary knew. She was secretly, and Justin knew he was Jack. He didn't know Mary was his other secret fiance. Mary didn't know Justin was Jack. No. She's Sir Justin's fiance, Thomas said. Isabella brightened up knowing she wasn't Jack's fiance. I'm very happy for you, Isabella said. Happy it was Justin, not Jack. He's a nut, said Mary approvingly. Who? asked Grimshaw. Sir Justin. He held up Terence to terror. Of Essex, the highwayman, said Mary. Justin looked nervous. Terry slapped Justin on the back. Near knocking him over. Friend Justin is a terror, said Terry, who was secretly the terror. Sir so Justin showed his colours, did he? Isabel, I was protecting Miss Gregory, said Justin, awkwardly. She's not grateful, said Grinshaw. The terror wants him dead. It was very foolish. Said Mary, not knowing Jack was Justin and the terror was his friend Terry. But had she known, things would have been easier for all of them. I think the terror can forgive him for protecting a young lady, said Terry. He was startled by someone giving him some of his own treatment. No doubt, laughed Terry, though he risked our lives on a stupid whim, Mary said. Sad he'd risk the life of the woman he loved. I knew he was a heartless man, said Isabella. Who said I loved her, said Justin coldly. It was a shotgun marriage. Mary and Justin didn't want to marry. Jack and his secret fiancé loved each other deeply. Their love would be their death. Knew he was a cad. He marries her for money, said Isabella. No for honour, said Sir Thomas. Mistake, not honour. Said Mary. Mistake? Kramer asked. What it was? Isabella said. I got lost in the forest one night. And he found me. My brother found us. To the wrong idea. He press ganged us into marrying. His... The last man in the world I would take for a husband, Mary said. Oh, poor girl, said Grimshaw. 
A lady must be careful of her honour, said Isabella. And her family, said Sir Thomas. And her friends, said Sir Justin sadly. Later on the road, a new highwayman chased down a lone rider. Stand and deliver, shouted the new highwayman. I could say the same thing myself, said the ghost, stopping pulling his gun on the new highwayman. What? said the new highwayman, stopping. Grimshaw, drop your gun. We only want to talk. A voice behind the new highwayman said. Sir Justin? Grimshaw said, recognising the voice. No, said Sir Justin, who was clad as Faulkner. You can't lie to me, said Grimshaw. I can if I like, laughed Sir Justin. We are here to help you, said the Earl, unmasking Essex, said Grimshaw, recognising him. Sorry, I didn't recognise you. I know we caught you, said the Earl. Why? To help you with your problem, said Sir Justin. What problem? asked Grimshaw. Isabella said to Justin. How to make her interested in you? asked Grimshaw. No, I don't need another fiance. I have two already, said Sir Justin. You cad, said Grimshaw. You know I don't love Mary, said Sir Justin. Oh, her. I'm sure. I don't love her either. No, we want to play Cupid with Isabella, said the Earl. Thank you. How she's in love with him, said Grimshaw, pointing at Sir Justin. She's in love with an image of a romantic hireman. Not me, said Sir Justin. You're the romantic hireman she loves. Grimshaw said. She thought I was you, said Sir Justin. Why would you say that? asked Grimshaw. I compared her eyes by error to silver stars, said Sir Justin. You told him, said Grimshaw. Only after he made a f of himself, said the Earl. By taking our... Uh, Taking to the highway surprisingly well, Sir Justin said. I recognised your voices from when you held us up. And you bear a strikingly family resemblance. Said, I'm sure, do we? Asked the dark eyed earl. His aunt and his father's I draw in both himself and his cousin. They remasked and rode off to talk more. Days later, Isabella and Grimshaw were riding in a coach to London again from Newmarket, where they were held up by two highwaymen. Stand and deliver, called the ghost, as the passengers alighted from the coach. Hello, said Isabella. Excited seeing Faulkner again, putting her hand out for a kiss. Faulkner ignored her. She was annoyed, made him happy. The ghost robbed her, ignoring her too. Isabella, they are robbers, they don't care for you. All they care for is your jewels, said Grimshaw. True, Faulkner, said Faulkner. They are beauties, your jewels. Isabella was horrified. You heartless beast, shouted Isabella, hitting Faulkner to the surprise of everyone. 
during the destruction, pulled out a gun and aimed it at his former rival. Isabella, leave him alone. He's not worth it, Grimshaw said. He is not, said Isabella sadly. Give us back our stuff and let us go on our way, said Grimshaw. Okay, said the ghost, handing back the stuff he took. Borkner reluctantly handing back the stuff he took. Now let's go, said Grimshaw. They did it. The coach drove off. Up to the road to terror. Mary is highwayman on horses. You did good, said Mary. Isabella looked at Mr. Grimshaw as a hero. I told him to tell her he was her poet by later. Now she sees him as he is. She'll like him more, said the ghost. I also told him to keep off the road as a highwayman. He's not safe. Too many dangerous folk about. And dangers in the occupation. Looks like a right pair of cads, said Terry. I hope this doesn't ruin my reputation, Faulkner said. They all laughed. Over the weeks that passed, John the highwayman and Mary the highway woman became inseparable and took to the roads most nights. They planned to run away and marry after one last job, but it all went wrong. There was an unexpected ambush. They were on their horses, and when they demanded the passengers disembark from the coach, they didn't notice the gun pointing from the coach until it was too late. But when they did, they rode away. It was Sir Thomas who shot one of them. John could have escaped. But he jumped off his running horse, which continued on its way. He ran back to his fiancée, the highwayman. You shot her, said John accusingly, kneeling down, cradling her and looking into her face. Why didn't you escape? asked the dying hero woman. I don't want to live without you, said John. I have the two of them. I shall unmask them, said Sir Thomas, unmasking. John, his eyes widening, and looked horrified. I said Sir Justin. You are engaged to my sister. Who is the harlot? asked Thomas, not knowing it was Mary, ripping off her mask. Looking devastated. Mary, no, cried Sir Thomas. Mary, my ever fiancé, said John. My love, said Mary and died. John kissed her for the first and last time. The Earl of Essex and someone called Captain Norton, a soldier from Lurton, are here to see John Faulkner, said a guard to the prison administrator. Essex, he's his cousin. Let him in said the administrator. They were taken to Jack's cell and left alone to talk to him. Jack, I'm sorry about what happened. I didn't want anyone to die, said Terry. We're here to break you out, said the Earl. You can't do that. You'd be revealing yourselves as the terror and the ghost, Drew said Jack. 
We don't care anymore, said Terry. We only want to see you free, said the Earl, who was a ghost. I don't want to live without Mary, said Jack. Thanks, though. I want to be with Mary in the hereafter. With that, the ghost and the terror left Jack in his cell to his fate. A few weeks later, John joined her in death. As John was standing on the gallows of Tyburn, Sir Thomas watched the noose go around John's neck. Sir Thomas was sad. He knew he'd missed John and Justin. The executioner reached for he pulled the lever for the trap door. Then the magistrate closed his eyes. He saw Mary and John lying there in the leaves in the forest. And he heard John saying, I have never seen anything so beautiful. I could forget everything and live in this moment forever.